All right, guys. Well, uh, you know, the Bible, it says the reformers, they, they call it the perspicuity of Scripture. You, know, you guys know what that means? We're going to learn a new word this morning. Perspicuity of Scripture. Does anyone know what that is? No. All right. I'm getting blank stares. Just means the clarity of Scripture. It just means the Bible is clear, that we all can understand what it means. Uh, but even though the Bible is clear, even though it's very clear about uh, James is going to talk about, we're only going to do three verses this morning. And those three verses, although they're very clear, there's, I don't think anyone in this room is going to misunderstand what James is saying. The problem is, is that it's not the, pro- the perspicuity of Scripture. It's not, the problem is not the, the lack of clarity in Scripture. The problem is, is, is the fact that we don't want to live those Scriptures out. It's very difficult. This is one of the hardest Scriptures to live out. Very easy to understand. I think we all know that this day was coming. In fact, um, last week (laughs) um, on on Sunday morning when we just did one verse, we just talked about who James is and got into it. And then we did a little warning towards the end there about about maybe not touching your phone 144 times a day. How many guys uh, did okay with that? Uh, Maybe maybe got it down to 140. Anybody? Uh, (laughs) Yeah? You guys, you guys at least think about how you utilize your phone, okay? And then maybe, you know, still four and a half hours. Uh, one guy on our team has 20 hours uh, a day. No, uh, I think it's just because it's, <laughs> yeah, I won't, na- won't name that person. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was good just to be reminded of the fact that we have to make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil and God has called us uh, to use our time wisely. But as I was thinking about this week, I'm like, oh, no, I, I, like, I know it's coming. I usually think about it like Sunday night, and I'm like, okay, what's, what's tomorrow I'm going to study tomorrow? Oh, shoot, it's a stupid trials passage. I remember that. Um, and so I, I, I go back in there, and I'm like, you know what? I just have this weird feeling that I, we're probably going to go through some trial this week. I, just, I, I don't know for sure, not sure if that's going to happen. And then, you know, all sorts of series of trials, big and small, you know, uh, anything in between. And I don't know about you guys, if you went through that, I don't know if it's just the Lord's way of just saying, hey, I need to humble you and you humble your family and just uh, the whole situation so that you come up there with just a little bit more of a humility when you're teaching on this subject. But um, I just, it seems like they never end. And I need this word from James to, to remind me the, of the perspective that I need towards trials. And so we're going to read uh, chapter 1 here, verse 2 through 4. It says this, that consider it all joy. All right, how are we doing there? It's just already we're failing, you know. Uh, verse 1 is great. I mean, that's about James. You know, he's, he's doing all right. Um, but my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing, it's key, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I'm going to pause there. This word consider, it is an actual command. It's a command. I find that very challenging, but also very helpful. Because do you remember when the Bible, it says the commands of God are not burdensome? They're good. And so I have to start there. I have to start with this, God, your commands are good. And you're telling me, everything you tell me is, is for my good. So consider it joy. And I love this. This is not meaning, hey, you need to put on a fake smile. You need to pretend that it's, it's a good thing. God's not saying that. And again, that's something really good for me to know because he's not saying pretend to everyone else. I know how you feel, but just pretend to everyone else that this is a good thing that you're going through a trial. He doesn't say that. And he also doesn't say consider it, consider it happy or consider it happiness that you're going through trials. Because many of us are not happy when we're going through trials. None of us are. That's just not how it works, right? And I love it that it I love that it says, feel it. It doesn't say it says consider it all joy, not feel it all joy. You're not going to feel joy at the front end of a trial or even the middle of it, right? We're not going to feel joy during that. But we have to how many know that when you're going through trials, we stop thinking and we start feeling. We stop all thinking. And the word consider is saying, okay, I want you to think right now when you're going through a trial and I want you to stop 
and I, consider, that's what it means, stop and I want you to think about what's about to happen or what you're going through. Because it's going to be good. And I'm telling you, that is the last thing. By the way, we don't, we don't want to just flippantly tell people uh, when they're going through a horrible trial, like somebody calls you like, hey, you know, what's going on? Or, you know, you're asking them what's going on in your world and they're telling you this horrible trial that they're going through and you just say, hey, babe, hey, consider it joy. You need to consider it joy. Now, are you telling them the truth? Yes. Did Jesus tell Lazarus' sisters, consider it joy? Did you think he had that in the back of his mind? His brother, James, is about to write this book in about 14 years. So it's true that we are to tell people at one point, maybe or maybe not, depends on the circumstances. But the first thing we tell people when they're going through suffering and trial, maybe it wouldn't be wise to say, consider it joy. The first thing Jesus did was weep. If you notice that in John 11, go back there. It's a really important passage and it teaches us how to actually respond to other people's trials. And he's telling us how to respond to our trials. He's saying, in your trial, consider it joy. Think about this. He's saying, think. Turn on your brain when you, got, when you have a trial. Isn't that, I mean, that good? Anyway, like, turn, just think about this. Don't feel this right now because you're feeling something is not going to be good. Do not trust your feelings. And then he says, when you encounter various trials, and that word encounter means come unexpectedly. How many of you know, like, God doesn't say in three weeks now you're going to have a trial. And this is what it's going to look like. Most of us would freak out three weeks prior to the trial and worry when, you know, three weeks before the trial, all the way through the trial and to the end of it. And then he'll tell you again, in about five months, you'll have another one. It'd be a miserable life in a way, but we're also equally scared that it comes unexpectedly. Right? I mean, some of us even have like maybe a little anxiety already of just thinking about that of saying like, okay, I know that they come unexpectedly. I'm going to encounter trials of all sorts of sizes, various trials, he says, all sorts of sizes, small, medium, large, overwhelming. And he also says this, that these trials, their hardships, there could be in the form of persecution. It could be in the form of some sort of discipline of the Lord in your life. They could be emotional, mental, physical, I mean, all, it, it's just, it's a huge umbrella, massive umbrella. And, and this helps us, right? Because if someone's going through something like, someone's going through persecution right now and you're like, and then you're going through some major physical issue and you're thinking, dude, that's not a trial. How many guys have actually done that? Like they're saying, they're saying, like maybe someone's new in their faith and they're like, dude, I'm going through a trial right now. And you're, and, and they're, and you're like, what's the trial? And, and you're saying, I'm like, dude, that's not a trial. I don't know what that is. That's easy. But the various trials is suited for you. Like God knows what it takes to actually do the work, right? I mean, he knows what it actually takes to do the work in you. And he's, you have to leave it. You have to trust him. And listen, you have to trust God in someone else's life. Like that is suited for them. That's helpful. Now listen, our, the word of the Lord for our church, well, at least one of them, friendship with God, right? Unity with one another. Great song, Ricky, by the way. And, uh, and, and faith for more, faith that God will do above and beyond. That middle one, unity, that's to help us be unified as a church. Because look, if all of a sudden you're starting to get bitter about your trial and somebody else looks like, man, I would switch places with you any day on this one, right? That's what we, you, I mean, sometimes you even do that. You're like, Oh, God, if you gave me that trial, I would ace it. You'd be proud of me. It'd be amazing. And God's like, that's why I didn't give you that one. Because <laughs> it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. You could go through trial like in, in an ineffectual, it could be ineffectual. But God's saying, I want it to be effectual. I want it to work. It's going to work. And, and really, verse 12 says it all. We kind of work backwards. We're only going to do four up to verse 4 today. And then next week, 5 through 12 and this whole passage right here has to do with trials. And he's saying this, blessed is the man. You are blessed if you persevere under trial. For once it has been approved, then you will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised those who love him. And then we'll get on to another subject, but it all kind of ties in one way. And so James is saying to us, 
Look at verse 12 and then back up. So like when you're going through a trial, it, is, it would behoove you to either, uh, either like memorize this thing or like Edson, tattoo it. This one would look nice on your back. Um, and and uh, so <laughs> you won't even look at me right now. So <laughs> but you, you, <laughs> you want to back up. You want to start with verse 12. When you're going through trial, verse 12, you're saying like, this is the vision, okay? You will receive the crown if you actually persevere. If you press the eject button, sometimes God will allow you to get out of that. There are certain ways, I mean, some trials like it, it's impossible to get out of. But I think there are some that it's like, you just press that button and you move on, or you just, you cover it up with a bunch of things that will distract you. Right, what we just talked about last week, like your phone. Your phone can distract you from the trial. It can't get, really get you out of it per se, but it will be ineffectual. It won't work. And so therefore God says, I'm going to have to give you another one similar so we can pass this test so you can look more like me. Amen? So that's the vision. He starts with verse 12 and then he backs up and he says, this is how you respond. So really this, this series is called, it's the Health of the House series. And you know, this is really helpful because we're not to be just a missional church. We're not to just be a church who loves one another, but we want to be a church, yes, we'll be friends with God, but God will take us through trials and tribulations because he wants us to be a radically whole family. He wants us to overcome this divided heart that really James, this whole book of James is talking about the divided heart. He's saying God is one, right? These people, the Jewish Christians, they understood Deuteronomy 6.4. Do you know what that is? It's the Shema. We all know this, right? Our Lord God is one. He is one. So therefore, he has oneness. He's not divided in any way. His people are divided, but he wants to make them one and whole. And so what happens is, is that these people are saying to James, like, James, you know I love the word. You know I love God. You know I go to church. You know I, I love the mission of God. Like, I'm involved. And But yet they're also saying this, that you know what, at the same time, I'm divided. <laughs> I'm not whole. Like I say with my mouth that I love God, but my actions, they don't match. I don't have what is called faith with feet. I'm getting used to the fact that I can listen to the word. I'm literally like, when you get to that place, okay, this is scary now, warning. If you've gotten to the place where you think it's okay to come and listen to the word and buy a $190 Bible and draw all into it and love your Bible, love God's word, but then say it's okay not to live it out, that is usually the time that God's about to bring you a trial because he doesn't want that to become normal in your life. That is the vision of James. He's saying, look, church, we can, I mean, I think we, we have become more theologically sound around here. I know that. We use bigger words than we did five years ago. You know, and, and we sing more theologically sound songs than we used to. Your iPad or iPod or whatever that's thing called, uh, uh, you know, what is that thing called? Uh, the, green, the green circle with the thing. Spotify. I couldn't think of it. Spotify. Okay. That thing. That looks different, doesn't it? It looks different. Many more people are going on mission. And you know what's cool? Because I know we get a hard time with mission. Like, I don't know. I mean, people need to go on mission and all that stuff. You know, this time we like backed off the pedal the last two years. We're like, we're just not going to, we're just going to say, uh, we're going here. And, and people that I never thought would just sign up that maybe needed that challenge years ago. And we're actually going out of our way. We were talking about the other day. We're like, to so this one person as a family, we're like, listen, I don't know if it's actually a good idea that you go. Maybe you don't want to go. You know, like we're kind of telling them, like, maybe just stay out, save your money. Like, just be present. Me on mission here. They're like, no, man, you're not taking away, this away from me. I'm going. So, like, we have these things. It's good. But James is saying, great. You have a lot of great things going. I mean, you're, you know, you're not a lost cause. <laughs> the community he's talking to that are scattered throughout. But you guys are beginning to be divided in some areas and it's actually concerning me and like a good doctor he then runs the test and he finds out and if you let him diagnose you find out what's going on the end result is going to be good we're going to if the goal in life is to look like christ everything's good it's good 
All right, we can consider it joy. Um, and by the way, we can consider it joy, like backing up, because God is in it. That's the only reason why. We're not, we're not like gluttons for pain. We're not like, this is awesome. God does not expect you to be like, this is awesome that I'm in this. He wants you to separate, okay, there's a, separate this, this trial, this pain that you're going through, this hardship, the thing that you can't get out of. He wants you to separate that part for a moment and say, you know what? Right here, I wish it was five weeks from now, whatever this thing is going to be over. Um, and by the way, it can, it can be over in death. And death is still a good thing, right, for us as believers because then you never have to go through a trial ever again. That's probably the, actually the best case scenario, by the way. But, but God is still... <laughs> I actually expected that, amen. But uh, yeah, <laughs> no. Um, but it is, it, it is true, and we do talk about it. And that's okay to even think that way and to say, you know what, because God wants us. There's other parts in Scripture that says that we, we have the, the hope of heaven. And that's one of the reasons why we go through trials is because he wants us to get um, off this whole American dream mindset. And so, all right, I have six purposes of trials. There's probably more, but I want to at least give you six right now. Number one. This is because God is in it, and this is going to, we can consider it joy for these particular reasons, so you can connect the dots. Number one, trials test our faith. You might be thinking, well, I don't want my test, I don't want my, I don't want my faith to be tested. It's not fun. Um, but it does test the fact that whether this is, this faith that you have is either genuine or it's weak, or in some cases, there, there is none. And why would that be good? I mean, I could connect all the dots for you. It would be good so that you don't have to spend all of eternity in a trial, a place called hell. Like you, you would want God to test your faith because you want to know for sure that you're going to heaven. You want genuine faith. Like that is, that is what we all want in this room. But that's not always the test for all of us. But how we handle trials speaks to the genuineness, the weakness, or the f lack of faith in our hearts. Matthew 13 says it like this, right? That some, the word of God falls on the rocky soil, the soil with thorns, right? Or the one that produces much fruit. It either causes us to be bitter or to draw near to God. And that depends on your perspective. That depends on the vision it depends on how much you know about trials. Do you remember? Okay, so I'm going to rattle off a few things here. But maybe perhaps now you are going through a trial in your marriage. 1 Corinthians 7.28 talks about that. That, look, if you want to get married, Paul's saying, you know, if, it would be better off if you remain like me, single. Most likely Paul probably was married at some point because he was in the Sanhedrin. And then maybe his wife deserted him, some scholars say, or whatever. And then Paul, he just says, I, I could... Just remain as me, single, so you could devote fully the, your, your life to the Lord. But you know, and I tell people this all the time, right? They're like, dude, I can't wait to get married. This is going to be so awesome. But I'm like, look, you're signing up for one thing. You're signing up to work. Do you understand that? The romance, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, but when that fades at times and certain times of the season, it's work. You're signing up to work. And and that's, that brings, trials bring that out. There, you, you, you'll have more trials. You'll have certain set of trials or specific trials in marriage than you would otherwise. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, Paul's saying in ministry you have trials because he got beat up a lot. He felt like a vessel that was, uh, that was broken. It doesn't feel right. So if you want to go into ministry, know you're signing up for ministry trials. If you're signing up for marriage, you're signing up for marriage trials. If you're signing up to have kids, you have, you have those trials as well. Um, also, John 11:33. there's the trial of death. And there's the trial for those who are loved ones watching their loved one die. And then John 16, 33, very simple, right? Jesus said that you will have trials and tribulations. You will have what is called trouble in this world, but I have overcome it. And so... Whether, that, whether right now you're going through trials in those areas or criticism, someone at the workplace is criticizing you, frustration. And that's the other thing too. People want bigger and better jobs. Well, you're going to get bigger trials, right? It's just the way it works. Um, and then uh, Exodus 16, 4, 
it says that God tested Israel with manna and he said, only take a day's portion to see whether they would trust him. I always go back to that passage and, and I always try to put myself in the situation. Would I be out there taking a little bit more manna for the next day? Right? I think we all would do that. Right? And then not only that, but I, I love this passage. It says in 2 Chronicles 32, 31, that God left Hezekiah, the king, alone to test him to see what was in his heart. God will use these trials. And it, I think if we, on the onset, we're like, okay, we're going through something. I think we want to pause and say, all right, I know I'm supposed to consider it, think about it, consider it joy. And the test of our faith, why, God, are you testing my faith? What is in my faith as of now that has a mixture of gold and other metals that are not pure? Why is, why is my faith not pure in this moment? And then the second thing is trials humble us. And, you know, I think if we think that life is about success, prestige, honors, um, things going well for us, it just weans us off of that self-reliant spirit. That, that self-reliance, there, there, as soon as a trial comes, I mean, you feel humbled. I mean, we could react in pride and then we can continue to go through more humbling, of course. But uh, that, remember when, John, when Philip was asked by Jesus, you know, go feed these people, fi- feeding the 5,000. He said, hey, I want you to trust that, that I'm God and I, I can provide for these people, even though it's seemingly impossible, impossible for you. He's, he's, he's testing us in our own resources. Many times uh, we'll find ourselves in those situations, small little situations a lot of times, and, and it's because we've been so self-reliant. And as soon as we go through a trial, it's just a quick reminder, right? It's a very quick reminder. I've been, I've been relying on myself too much. Or sometimes a thought comes, and in some level of success in your workplace or, or in your marriage, and just that, you don't have to agree with it, but look, sometimes the lie of the enemy will come flying through your mind and uh, someone will say, man, you know, you're doing such a great job as a parent. And you just say, you know what? As a matter of fact, I am. That's amazing. Love that. How did you know? <laughs> and it's like, if you really, really agree and you say, like, you don't say, get away from me, Satan. Um, you could be quickly humbled in that, in that moment or at least several moments after that moment. <laughs> How many of you have been there? I mean, literally like seconds later, I'm like, yep, definitely not the cause of the fruit. I'm not the cause of that fruit happening. It's totally the Lord. Number three, the trials remind us of the hope of eternity. That's what that man over there was amening. Um, the hope of eternity. It just quickly reminds, these. this is usually like a severe trial and it, it makes us remember again and again and again, like why are we putting so much stake in our retirement? Why are we planning so much for the future? And one day we're not gonna work and one day we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that. We're planning all this stuff. And James later on says, hey, that may not be a good idea because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. Like you should probably say if the Lord wills. And again, we don't have to say that every little, but it's a deep seated faith understanding of like, God is in control of everything. And if he wants me to have this nice retirement one day, then so be it and bless others with it. But don't plan it as if eternity will never happen. That's the problem. And we've heard stories, right, of people that not, they didn't get to that place of retirement. And it's a sober reminder of us that why are we putting so much faith and so much stake and so much hope in this world, just this world alone and blessings upon blessings upon blessings upon blessings trains us as a people to rely on ourself, to think our faith is good. And and thirdly, really just never think about heaven. That's bad. That's why we say trials are good. But it, but just a cursory reading of it, just like, no, they're not, they don't, We should not consider them joy. That's ridiculous. Only like really holy people think that way. People that never, things never go well for them go think that way. They always have a smile on their face. I don't get him. But it could be for all of us and that is the health of the house. God is wanting us to be a people who are whole and understand what he is in the business of doing, which is to make us more like him. Number four, trials expose what we really love and value. I mean, they all kind of play on each other. 
Genesis 22. I mean, remember Abraham? I mean, I heard Jordan Peterson the other day. I don't listen to him often, but he was just saying something. About he's, such, he's got such an intellectual understanding of the Bible. And he's talking about Abraham in such a way that's just like so foreign. I mean, he's, all, he's right about the story. I mean, he, just, he could definitely like, even articulate it better than I can. But it's void of this relationship with God. And that when, when Abraham, he was so blessed in so many ways, and yes, he went through things, but the biggest trial I think we can all agree upon, the biggest trial he went through was to give up his son. Because he was exposing something. God was saying, look, everything's kind of in one sense, you know, it's going well for you. It's like with Job. We can name a Peter, a lot of them, right? And, and at that moment, God's saying, is he willing to give up the thing most important to him? And what does it look so cruel, right? If you understand the story, again, a, a very plain reading of it, you would think God is so cruel. Finally, he, like, he was, like, God's not satisfied with his first son that he had, right, with Hagar. God's like, no, you, you missed that one. That wasn't, that's not the son of the promise. And so they have to wait. I mean, again, you know, and he's a, a few decades in, and he has to wait again. He finally has it, and God's saying, actually, could you give him to me? Yet the Bible talks about later in Hebrews 11 and then later in Romans that this was an act of faith and it was credit to him as righteousness because of his faith. And now we are all sons of Abraham because of that. And I mean, I don't think he understood that at that point. He's father Abraham. And you know how the, the, those crazy jokers in the Bible, right? The Pharisees, they distorted that father Abraham thing. Classic passage in Romans, I mean, uh, John 8, right? Classic passage where he's, they're all like, dude, my father is Abraham. No, he's not. The devil's your father. <laughs> it's like, that's like the one I want to be a fly on the Pharisees' little hair. <laughs> like, just want to look at their face, you know. Well, I can't because it's on their hair, but you, you know what I mean. <laughs> like, but like, just want to see the face, you know, like, huh? Like, no, we're Jewish. Like, we're the, we're the sons of Abraham. Like, no, you don't understand. Abraham believed when it was, he was in a trial and, it, and, it, and he was so devastated, but yet he trusted me and he didn't give into the world. He, I, I tested what he valued and, and, and I know that this man loved me because he trusted me. You don't trust me. Therefore, you don't love me. Your father's the devil and you're just assuming that you're in, but you're out. Woo! Big time. And so this, he exposes, and maybe not in such dramatic ways, but this is how people get saved sometimes, right? I mean, like, that's what happened to me when I was 18. I would, didn't, you know, my parents drove me three hours to college, dropped me off, and I'm like, please take me home, you know? I don't, I don't think we're ready for this. And I was just lonely and depressed and, and wondering, man, which way is up? And then just spending about a, a month of classes you know, it during, and just not knowing what I'm doing and just coming home and just being by myself. And then I, 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 I finally take out the, this track that I got in the summer in LA from, from, a, from this couple. And, uh, you know, they give me this thing and I'm like, I don't want to read it. I'm like, I'm not interested in it. But when I'm at my lowest and I, I could not get my way and I'm looking out my bedroom window and I see just empty beer cans. And that is an, a symbol of my life is empty. And God got my attention at 18. And he said, you are lost. And you will be just as empty of those beer cans for the rest of your life if you don't have me. And so I'm reading this thing. I understand the gospel he, because he's exposing in me what I loved and I loved the world and it left me empty. It doesn't just have to happen in salvation, but in Luke 14, 26, he used this amazing figurative expression to teach that our love for God should exceed all other loves. He's not saying literally, like, if you, if you don't hate your mom and dad and your brother and sister. He's just saying, like, in comparison, if you even love your family and you idolize your family or your marriage above me, I will have to take you through things 
to expose the fact that that is not proper and right, and therefore you cannot even love those people if you don't love me more than them. That's a good word right there. Because it's counterintuitive, isn't it? If you love God above all else, you'll be able to love everybody else, including your spouse, the people that you love the most. Psalm 63, does your, does your heart, does literally, I mean, every time you read passages like this, it should convict us. He's saying this, he's like, your loving kindness is better than life. Our lives, some of the people in this room, our lives are so good in a worldly sense, that makes no lick of sense to you. You're like, I know I, I should get there, but I'm not. Or some of you don't even care. And he's saying, look, your loving kindness is better than life, so my lips will praise you. I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with morrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. I remember you on my bed and meditate on you in the night. You have been my help. When you wake up in the middle of the night, who do you think of? It's like there's this love relationship that makes the Pharisee and anyone else in that line of thinking very uncomfortable. But this should be our life. This should be our poem. This should be is what is in our heart, written on our hearts. This is that love relationship that we are to have with God, our Father. And when we don't go, when we don't have that, when we, when that song doesn't make sense. Do you ever just get on a back end of a trial and you're just like, man, God is so good. It's amazing. You're like, that's easy. Let's just, just turn another one, Ricky. Just play another one, play another one, play another one. This is awesome. I love worshiping. But when you're like on a front or when life is good and it's amazing and you're just going through life and you're like, oh, Lord, keep me here. Keep me here. Keep me here. What's that about worship? Just keep me here. That is not a good place to be. And I'm not asking you to be cynical and I'm not saying like, oh boy, here comes, every time life's good, here goes the trial. John just wants to be in me and be in a trial and everyone wants me to be happy. Woe is me. No, that's not what I'm saying. I didn't say that, did I? I didn't say that at all. I said that now, but I didn't say that. Okay? <laughs> I didn't say that. Fifth thing is it strengthens us to endure for greater purposes. While things are quiet and comfortable, we live by feeling rather than faith. And the reality is that uh, one Puritan says a soldier, but, but the, the worth of a soldier is never known in times of peace. You never know what they're made out of. You wonder in your discipleship, in your life group, what are we made out of? Like when, you know, it's just, you never know until things hit people's lives. And on the back end, you're like, wow, that person really does love God. Man, they are trustworthy. Man, they are strong in their faith. I want, and it builds trust and camaraderie in the, in, within your church. When I'm weak, I am strong. 2 Corinthians 10, 12, 10, Hebrews 11 shows how trials and endurance led to victories. What a great passage, Hebrews 11, right? The hall of faith. It says that James says, through trials we know. That word, it says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. That word knowing is not a not factual. That's why, okay, you could read books on trials, but it will never get you through it necessarily because what he's saying, the knowing is, is through experience. It's personal experience. It's like, I know that trials produce endurance. That's the difference sometimes between believers and non-believers because you can look them in the eye and, and they're like, I don't get how you're going through that. And you're like, I know my God is going to get me through this. And they're like, that's crazy faith. It should feel that foreign. It should not feel like when a believer is talking to a non-believer and you're just complaining about how life is awful and this and that. And they're like, yeah, no, man, it's all, it is bad. You know, it's going to get worse. You know, like there's no hope there. But when you're saying, I know, that is a testimony because it's felt, it's real. And then we are... And what he's saying is like, at the end, we'll know that this testing produces its perfect result and it'll be complete. We know we're his. Some of us really struggle with, with um, what is called assurance of faith, right? We struggle with that. Some of us really struggle. And I know I've talked to you guys about that. And sometimes I don't really have answers. I don't know other than the scriptures. But you know, when God takes you through a trial and you pass and you get through it on the other end, do you not know, it says in Romans 5, do you not know deeply and that God loves you, you're his. We can read all books about the, the assurance of faith and those, those, they're fine, they're fine. 
We can read passages, but this is an experiential knowledge that when you finally go through it and you pass the test on the other side, man, we know we're his. There's without a doubt. And he even says that through Hebrews 12, right? That, you know, God takes us through things. He disciplines those he loves. And so if you're feeling a sense of discipline of the Lord even right now, right now as you speak, that's a good sign. It may not feel good. And he even says that it doesn't feel good in the moment. You're not supposed to be happy about that, but you rejoice. There's a deep joy knowing that I'm his. The reason why there's so much anxiety in the, in, in the world is because you don't know yet you're, peace, you're at peace with God. If, ever, if the world would know they're at peace with God, there, wouldn't, there would be way less anxiety. I'm not saying it would totally eradicate it, but it would be way less. Because anxiety comes with we don't know our status with God. And we don't know our status with one another. That's where it comes from. But we're secure. And Paul said that in 1 Thessalonians 3 and 2 Thessalonians 1. He was concerned for their faith. He's like, I don't know. I don't know where you're at. And a year later, their faith increased because it says they had endurance. They went through trial as well. And that's a great passage to even meditate and look at uh, later. And then number six, and lastly, trials equip us to comfort us and other, to, com- to comfort us so that we might comfort other people. So they equip us. Don't you know that to be true? The best people in this room, the, the ones who have mercy gifts, the people that, man, they just are so loving. You want to sit next to them when you go through a trial, the ones who've gone through it themselves. They're not book smart, they're street smart, we'd say it that way, right? And so God has called some of you guys to actually step it up a little bit. You've been through some stuff. Utilize it. Like actually utilize that. And here's a homework assignment for some of you guys. Go around the room to people that are maybe older and more mature in your faith and ask them, what was it like to go through that trial? Learn from them. What I understand about, and I wrote this, I remember in one of my books, it was, it was uh, one day I was just walking and I was, I was studying on trials and everything. And I, I just saw in the, like my mind's eye, like I wanted to find out more about how pearls were made. And I was wondering like how those were made and the Holy Spirit was showing me through science and just how this clam would have a piece of irritant that would go inside the clam. And it would just, it would be irritating. It'd be frustrating to this little poor guy, you know, in his house. (laughs) He's got a little intruder, but this intruder, right, will turn into something glorious and big and beautiful. And so he begins to let go of this stuff called, I think, necrar, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right. But it, it, would, it would begin to cover with this beautiful, shiny substance, cover that piece of sand. And over time, it would become a pearl. And so what's interesting about pearls is that one named, one, one coined it, pearls are victory over irritation. Isn't that good? What I want you to do in this room, and I think this will bring unity this year, is I want you to find the pearls in the room because there's a lot of people that go through some pretty painful and irritating stuff and they've found victory. And it would be good for you to find those people and ask, how did that go? What was that like? Some of you guys been through some serious stuff in the room. Some of you just, you know, small, medium-sized trial, but they're helpful for the next generation. They're still helpful. And again, we're talking like even mental distress and emotional distress and things that, you know, you can't control. Those are trials to bring you closer to God. We don't want to judge one another's trials, but receive from them. They're pearls in the room and it would be good to find those people. All right, as we close here, um, I thought this was a really good quote by, uh, by a pastor, Wearsby. Do you guys know Warren Wearsby? Old school guy, you know. Some of the old school, yeah, old school guys, the old guys know who I'm talking about. Okay. Um, But this is what he says. Our values determine our assessments. He's talking about that whole idea of considering it joy. If we value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us. If we value material and physical things more than the spiritual, then we won't be able to count it all joy. If we live only for the present and forget the future, the trials will make us bitter not better. You see, what, what the problem is in this room, and I would say for most of the church, is that trials are one big inconvenience to our life. That's why we don't consider it joy. 
Is it right? As soon as that, <laughs> as soon as that trial, trial comes down the pipeline in our life, the first thing we do is not consider it joy. We complain or we freak out. And there, that is telling to what our vision is. That is telling, James is saying, listen, the reason why you cannot consider it joy, the reason why you want to wiggle your way out of this is because you don't have the perspective. Your perspective is that this is one big inconvenience to our busy, self-centered lives. God, I don't need this. I can read this in a book if I want to grow closer to you. I can, I can find there's got to be some other way to shape me into the likeness of Christ. And God's saying there is no other way. The reading of the Bible teaches you about the character of God so that by the time you go through a trial and you understand the vision, you understand the character, it's not meant to just get you like out of a trial or get or avoid, I should say, avoid a trial. The, the purpose of the scriptures is to, is to know God and to know why he, he has not left us in the dark as it relates to trials. Thank you, Lord. I mean, most of us were like, we wish this was not in the Bible, but then at the same time, all of us should say we're thankful that it's in the Bible. Because again, here's the shepherding, right? He's the shepherding Christ in our life. He's the shepherd. He comes into our life and he shepherds us and he says, look, I want to shepherd you through this. I want to show you that this trial is actually for your good. The question I have for you is, do you want to be whole? Ask that honestly. Like, do you want to be whole? Because that follow-up question is, is going to be the kicker, right? Then you're going to go through trials. And we can consider it joy because he knows that the, this result is going to make us whole and perfect, undivided. If you love God more than anything else in this world, then we'll be able to consider it joy. But if we love the world more and our lives more than we love God, then there is no way, no way you're going to be considering it joy when the trials come. That's the perspective change. It's crazy, but I want us to really think through the next time you're going through something, whatever it is, whether you're in the, whether you physically are going through the trial or somebody else is, and that is, the trial for yourself too because you're suffering with. I want you to pause in that moment and say, Lord, I want you, help me, please. Help me to consider it joy. Give me the perspective right now before it's too late. I have to, I have to get that first before I start listening to the bombardment of the lives of the enemy or the voices of even my closest friends like Job's friends were. First week, classic, awesome. They were with him, didn't say much if at all. Weeks afterwards, the whole situation was a mess. It's because they opened up their mouth. So be there, model after Jesus. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis, and we'll close here, but the, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes to rebuild that house, and at first, perhaps, you understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he, knows, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts ab abdominally and, and, and does not seem to make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building qu quite a different house than the one you thought of. Throwing out, the new, throwing out a new wing over here, putting on an extra floor over here, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace and he intends to come and live in it himself. If we let him, he will make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through which with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot imagine, a bright stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly. The process will be long and in parts very painful, but that is what we are in it for and nothing less. That's what we got to think of. When we're on a front end of a trial, we're like, man, if the end product is worth having, if like this end product, we know where this is going, 
then the pain along the way is worth enduring. It's worth it. And we can encourage each other and say, it's worth it. Maybe not right away. Maybe just pray for them and love them and care for them. But we can then count all the trials as joy. I mean, there's all sorts of stories, even with my kids or in our life in the past. And I mean, I've just had to hold myself back from so many just different stories. And, you know, I struggle whether to, what do, they, what do the people need right now? And as we balance this thing, but I remember one of my kids was like terrified of dogs, kind of like their dad when he runs, um, <laughs> but terrified of dogs. And just to the point of just like freaking out every time he would see a dog, like every time he'd see a dog, vicious, you know, the thing would, you know, maybe growl or whatever, not even, he would just like start to move behind me and walk away. Well, one day this dog, our neighbor's dog, like ran through our house. I mean, that was terrifying. I mean, like ran through this dog we don't even like, we don't know, <laughs> ran through and jumps out of our bed. And like, I mean, I'm freaking out. He's freaking out. Everyone's freaking out. And I remember thinking, I'm like, man, this is not, this is not what I wanted because this is making things worse. I mean, he's never going to go over the fear of dogs like ever. And um, I remember thinking, I'm like, okay, what would the Lord do? What would the Lord do? And I remember going for a run one day and I ran past the house and I just got this idea. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take him over to that guy's house and we're going to knock on the door and we're going we're gonna to trust that the Lord's going to overcome this kid's fear of dogs, which you think like give him what he fears. That's not a good thing. You know, like maybe just like kill every dog in sight would help, but that would not be a good idea. Um, uh, maybe cat, every cat in sight, right? We're just on this little thing here. Um, dog, no. Um, so we go, we go, and I'm like, I'm like, all right, we're gonna go across the way. We're gonna go to the, we're gonna go to the house. Knock on the. He's like, no, I'm freaking out. He's standing behind me. I'm not gonna do it. And I'm like, knock on the door. Of course, the neighbors. At, it's like, what, what do you want? I was like, do you, can you, can you bring me your dog? Um, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's kind of awkward. You know, you think about like how this is gonna go. And uh, sure, uh, they brought the dog out. The dog's like all, you know, going crazy and stuff. And we just, you know, just calmly, little by little, we just, the dog sits then, the neighbor kind of figures out what's going on. And I, I'm just like bringing him from around me and just saying, hey, this is just a dog. It's a dog, it's just chilling. And it's no problem, not biting you. And, and just kind of just enjoy that moment in its fullest. And, you know, I mean, I'm not saying like right after that, I mean, you just jump a little bit and jolt. But after that, I think it not only taught him how to overcome his fear with dogs, but how to overcare, overcome his fear in other things. That's what God does. He takes us by the hand. He's saying, you're not going to fear that stuff anymore. You're not going to be terrified of trials. You're not going to be afraid of those things. They're there to help you. Trials are there to help you. They're, there, they're, they're not there to, they're not going to comfort you. They're there, they're there to help you. And so taking, taking him by the hand and showing him that this thing that is terrifying and scary and can rip your head off, ultimately trials are there to make you perfect and endurance and strong and ultimately complete and whole a man of God. Amen? That's what God has called us to. And that word about victory, the irritants, man, it's, I love that, I love that word, that literally a pearl is, is, is victory over the irritants. That is our calling in life. God has called us to be those people. And I want us to be confident this year that when a trial comes, it's not fun. It's not consider it happy. It's not feel it joy, but it's consider, it's just pause, let's think about this for a second. I know my God is going to use this thing right here, not fun in the moment. He's going to use it to not only help me endure, to overcome, but then to be perfect in Christ so that I can endure more down the road and become more like him. Amen? That's what we're called to. So, Father, thank you for giving us this word, even though these two or three verses are terrifying to many in the room. And even they've caused me much anxiety even reading it, and especially sometimes when things are going well, we read this and we're saying, Lord, I don't want those things to come. I don't know when they're going to come, but it says we encounter them. It means that we're going to, uh, we're not going to be able to pick our trial. We're not going to be able to choose our trial. We're not going to be able to choose the timing of that. And that you bring it upon us sometimes when we least expect it, not because you're cruel, but because you love us and you care for us and you want us to endure as people. You want to test our faith to show that it is genuine and proven 
to be true and that you're with us in the journey. And Lord, I pray that you help us to consider it joy because it is that command that you, you tell us. It's an act of faith. It's an act of worship, really, to say it is joy so that you would uh, strengthen us through this thing. We come out the other end uh, strong. And Lord, we don't have to be terrified of a trial, but we can embrace it as, as a part of your tool, as a part of the way you bring about these things in our lives so that we might look more like you, Jesus. And Lord, I pray for that perspective and that vision in our own life, again, that we're, if, if we've gotten off, you know, we're just, we've but, bitten into the lie of the American dream, or we've just bitten into this understanding that, you know, maybe perhaps God never wants us uh, poor, or uh, he never wants us sick, or he never, he never wants us uh, to go through anything hard. Um, it's just a lie. It's a, it's, a, it's a lie in Christianity, a false sense of Christianity. It's a lie. That, uh, that God doesn't want us to go through any of that. But yet James is speaking to these people that were uh, poor <laughs> and they were hurting and they were struggling in so many ways. And he said, you know what? I want you to consider this joy because God has a purpose in it. So Father, teach us again. Teach us how to go through these trials and tribulations. Teach us how to have a kingdom mindset, not an American mindset, but a kingdom mindset. Flip it on its head. I mean, some of us just have just bitten into false theologies over the years and we've, and we've, life's been so good and we need to thank God and we need to treasure the, the good times. We need to even say, Lord, thank you for this time right now that things are going well and it's wonderful and, and we treasure those moments because they are a taste of heaven in a way. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful blessing, but you do have another definition of blessing. As it says in verse 12, we're blessed if we persevere through trials because we know we win the crown. And that's victory. That's real victory. The world defines victory as everything goes well. You define victory as allowing one of those little pieces of irritants to come into our home and to make things a little uncomfortable so that you might make a pearl out of it. And Lord, I pray that you help us to understand that more and more. And Lord, if people are hurting, I pray for extra grace, more grace right now pouring out into their trial and tribulation, small, medium, large, overwhelming. I do pray for people that are just enduring just the same thing over and over and over again. It just seems like, okay, I thought, you know, it's like Groundhog Day, I'm waking up and I'm just, it's the same story. Uh, that I have to deal with the same thing over and over again. Maybe it's just a mindset or, a, you know, just the, the fact that you're still single or the fact that, you know, you don't have the job you want or you're having to take care of, you know, the elderly or the people, uh, your parents and, and whatever it might be, or you're sick with the same thing. And it just no matter what diet you're trying, it's not working. Or there's just so many frustrations and you feel like you're waking up like that guy in the movie. It's just like, I thought it was gonna be, the next day, but it's not, it's the same day and it feels like that. And I do pray for grace, that the perspective change is sometimes all we need. The child does not need to change, but the perspective has to change. We must see vision, the vision of James. We must see this, that it is possible, that it is right to consider it, to think it joy, to think it joy um, when we encounter this and when we're in the midst of this, because we know this is putting muscle in us, it's strengthening us in a unique way that otherwise it would never happen. And we do pray, Father, that you would help us to stay in it and not press the eject button so that we might see its complete work, which is perfect, completeless, it's whole. Uh, we're kind of sick of the, uh, the, the divided heart. We don't want that there anymore, the lack of character in these particular I issues and areas of our life. Uh, we pray for for victory and a lot of us are praying for victory and we just don't know which way it'll come um, sometimes it's just just humbling ourselves and just saying you know what I got this problem and I just want to expose it to a friend and that even in and of itself is the painful process that you want us to go through and it would maybe perhaps the trial so to speak would stop there and you go on a journey of freedom over your sin all these things Lord you know in the people uh, we do pray that uh Every person would feel known here this morning, uh, would feel loved by you, pursued by you, that you are a shepherd who brings us through the trials, 
Um, you don't wait for us on the other side saying, hey, once you get through, I'll be there. But you, you like we learn in Psalm 23, you go before us, you go with us, and you go behind us. And uh, I thank you for that image, that uh, that is who you are. And we need, we need to know that that is who you are. That's your character. And so it is helpful then for us to go through what we go through. In Jesus' name. Why don't we stand to our feet and be ministered again by the Lord. And if you guys need prayer, um, please don't hesitate to ask. We'd love to pray for you.